we all are these like complicated mix up of, of humans and feelings and like learning and interests and shame and all of that. And like, we are stuck in these bodies that work sometimes not in the ways that we want them to or look not in the way that we're told they're supposed to mm -hmm. or that we would change with a magic wand if we were given the chance and like there is a lot a lot of discomfort of just like sitting in this body that you have right where it is mm -hmm. and being like here we are there's a lot of discomfort in that and yeah. i think a lot of of my job is sitting in that discomfort with people people are fascinating especially up close, more especially when you get them talking about the things that they love. This is From the Hip, conversations in the service of passion, purpose, and play. I'm Adrienne Gunn. You ready to play? Today on From the Hip, we're talking about sex, polyamory, and the patriarchy with two of my favorite sex educators, or sex experts, Amory Jane and Gretchen Lee. Okay, so you're ready? You're happy? I'm ready. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling ready. <laughs> I just want to tell you about my butt. Okay, tell me about your butt. Okay, so this morning, I had this moment in the bathroom that I was very excited about. Mm -hmm. It's a little hilarious because I put on these jeans, and I haven't worn these in a year because I was larger, mm -hmm. and I've lost weight, and I put these jeans on, and then I was in the bathroom, and I was like, oh, yeah. And what I'd forgotten about, about me is that as I get more fit and my body gets to do more things, not only can I feel more things, but I apparently there's this like small level of vanity mm -hmm. where I get really into myself and it makes life yeah. more enjoyable. So I had this like flash of pleasure moment of like, oh, yeah, that. That's awesome. And I got very excited and yeah. I thought, since you were kind of uh, built like a superhero, and an athlete, mm -hmm. but I thought you might appreciate that story. I do appreciate that story. I feel like that's where a lot of, like, I love how many times in my life people are like exactly, not exactly what you just said, but exactly like this weird thing happened at this like moment of self-love, sexuality, pleasure, fitness, whatever, and I, you were the person I wanted to tell you about it. Like, yeah. that happens to me so often, and I'm really excited that I've become that person. <laughs> like. Just yesterday, I had a friend at the gym who, like, we almost only talk about sports stuff, but she, like, knows what I do and knows who I am in the world. And she was like, Gretchen, I just, you were the, I had sex last night for the first time in forever, and it was great, and you were the person I wanted to tell about it. And I was like, great, I love, like, that this is the person that I've become. So congrats on Thank feeling you. good about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Part of what's fascinating about it. Yeah. It, you know, like Einstein's theory of relativity, right? Mm -hmm. And Einstein time. Sure. There's apparently also like a relativity of body because mm -hmm. literally a year and a half ago when I had to buy these jeans, I was grumpy about it because mm -hmm. I was larger than I had been. Mm -hmm. And I was like, ah, like I'd, I've been like doing tennis and other things yeah. and my metabolism and my hormones were freaking out and I was like not getting like more fit. I was getting just more like injuries and freaking yeah. out. And so. Yeah. When I bought these pants, I was grumpy about it. I was like, mm. no, you just have to buy things that fit and look nice. I'm like, okay, they're all right. And now, since I've like dropped 15 pounds to get back into these pants, it's like, mm. yay, party! Yeah. Same fucking pants. Yeah. Different emotions about them. Yeah, and I think like, I don't know, I, it's, I try and stay away from a very like weight loss, weight gain focused mm -hmm. method of, of personal training or of health or whatever. Yeah. And so like, I think, but it, you know, I don't want to ignore that that is definitely some people's goals or helps or hurts with happiness levels, all right. of that. But I think there is a lot to be said for changing your own idea about your body or accomplishing something that you wanted to accomplish, whether or not it's weight related. Yeah. And like that sort of being able to look at your body and be like, hell yeah, you know, that's awesome. Yeah. I think like for myself, I've changed body size and shape so many times um if we do do you want do you want to just get into it yeah. okay Sorry um, when i was in high school i had a life-threatening eating disorder um here's some things you might not know about me i i was like diagnosably by the dsm for uh, anorexic for five years um mm -hmm. from age like 15 to 21 um in there 
and I was very, very small. I was a very, very small person. And that, like, I experienced the world as a tiny, frail person for so long, but with this, like, really brain-killing message that, like, you know, part of it was about being thin and being small, but mm -hmm. so much more of it was just about, like, self-hatred and sure. disappearing and, like, you know, shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and that being, like, the only thing that I felt like I had purpose to do. Um, and then becoming, out of that, becoming an athlete, and, like, I, as, as I stand before you today, I am somewhere in the ballpark of 70 pounds heavier than I was mm -hmm. for, like, that whole chunk of my life, um, which at age 26, that, like, five years is a big chunk of my life. Right. Um, yeah. And, like, yeah, I'm, I'm 70 pounds heavier, and I... I've gained, I gained that weight in like two years. Nice. Um, and it's, it's really interesting now to be someone who competes in weight class sports and like have to monitor for just like, even if it's just for that reason, like having to monitor when I've gained five pounds or lost five pounds or whatever and like, and get myself on track before competitions and, right. and have that sort of monitoring of my body size for a purpose outside of worth yeah um, it's really interesting it's like a it's really changed my relationship to my body but I know like the first times that I competed in a weight class in weight class sports and powerlifting was my first experience of that like it was really stressful and I got scared of like is this gonna bring up those same sort of self-deprecating concern feelings about having to lose weight and having to do that and it did a little bit that definitely yeah. like prickled in my brain but at this point now it's like that around competitions that weight loss or that monitoring is so much more mechanical um that it's not it doesn't feel anymore like it's tied to that emotion of like i'm doing good i'm doing bad i'm thin i'm not right and that i don't know it's just a really interesting emotional difference Heck, so, yeah. Well, yeah. one of the things that I had glossed over when I was talking about yes. the weight that I experienced, like I specifically, I, I've been sharing it as like putting on grief weight and mm -hmm. that I specifically made a decision about three-ish years ago to engage with pleasure in a different way and to mm -hmm. fully experience like deciding emotions are important. Mm -hmm. I happen to have grief right now and sadness right now and so I'm going to ex like find the ways to access pleasure. And the one way that I could, it seemed, was like burgers and cake, but then eating them fully, mm. and then showing up to life in a different way. Because I had been approaching life with this like, more of an athlete mindset of like, mm. get everything out of life, and then optimize and life hacking. Yeah. And there was just this shut off mm. of my motivation because a good friend of mine had died, and a relationship yeah. had ended in a particular way, so that I just, I did sort of lost access to that. So it was a really interesting thing for me to give, to start a new way of engaging with my body and myself and my emotions and paying attention and that, like a slowness. Yeah. And when I was attempting to do things that I was like, oh, life needs to feel better. I'm going to run a lot, hit things in an athletic way. Mm -hmm. Having the, the results be counter hmm. to what I'd experienced in the past. And so I went through this like a slowness and what does happen, it happened for me as I put on more weight, the ability for me to feel that as my mobility shifted, as I yeah. wasn't being as active, my ability to engage and feel my life in a particular way shifted and somewhat diminished. Hmm. So there's a ways in which like, um, and I'm, I'm certain that plenty of people who've, who've put on weight or, or have more weight mm -hmm. may or may not be using it as like padding of keeping distance from people, but there is a way in which mobility, how we engage in our, in our bodies, changes how we experience the world. And not just how we're treated, but like. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I am very much, as someone who is still regarded as a thin fit person, like I am super hesitant to talk about what the experience of being fat is like. Fair. Like I, you know, that's not my thing to talk about and I am, I am and always will be an advocate for people being whatever the fuck size they want to be. Sure. And like, you know, I think that that is something that should be left up to every individual and I will absolutely celebrate my fat friends and lovers and co-athletes and all of that and mm -hmm. it's super important. I know that like 
for me as my body has changed and gotten bigger and smaller, it is interesting to watch how that fluctuation relates to my ability to relate to myself. And like, it's uncomfortable for me when I push outside of what the some old voice in my brain says that I should be. Mm -hmm. um, but in that place of like being very, very small and unhealthily small, I it was so uncomfortable. It was so uncomfortable to exist in that body yeah. um, in a in a very physical way and an emotional way. But like you know, I was cold constantly, and there are all these symptoms and side effects of eating disorders that no one tells you about, right. um, where you start to like grow weird fine hair all over your body in an attempt to keep yourself warm. Okay. Um, called lanugo. Um, that's like gray and kind of looks like a baby duck. I'm gonna um, pause you a minute. Like. I was joking earlier, I literally set the thermostat lower in my house than normal, just in case you're like always burning. <laughs> now at this point, like I have normal body heat fluctuations, it's yeah, great. Yeah, and like, but that sort of thing about being at the weight and size that my body wants to be is so different than like this sort of idea of I have to do something a particular way, I have to like continually strive to be more perfect because of some idea in my head of what perfect is. Yeah. And like, I think where, where this sort of relates to me is that like, I've always been a perfectionist in a lot of ways. And w even more than just the perfection of going to societal standards of being thin and whatever, and that being like what the world wants me to be. Right. I think perfection for me always has looked like working as hard as possible. Right. Being at the end of to where no one could ever say that I was lazy. Sure. And like, and so that was a path that my eating disorder led me in that outside of just like, we have a society that thinks that thinness is attractive. That hardly came into it. It was more that like people socialized as women and the pressure in my particular family and in my own issues around abandonment and seeking love and all of that. I had this strong drive that like the farther I could go into this realm of like working and driving and discipline and all of that, mm -hmm. then the the more I could quiet the voice in me that was saying that I wasn't doing enough. And so being like as thin as I could possibly be and still like going to school and getting straight A's and maintaining relationships and all of that, I like finally got some sort of relief to that perfectionism of saying right. like, you're, you're at the end point here. Like yeah. you're doing okay. Um, and I think one of the most painful parts of going through recovery from that was having to accept that some of the recovery and getting back to a place where I actually could experience happiness and joy and pleasure mm -hmm. meant being lazy sometimes. Yeah. I could no longer be at the end point of perfection and drive and motivation if I ever wanted to be happy again. Because it's, it's, it's counter to mm -hmm. achieving that. Yeah. And so like that is definitely, and I've heard this reflected in other people with similar experiences, that was definitely one of them, continues to be one of the most painful parts of recovery from, from a disorder like that, of having to be like, sometimes like eating whatever I want because it tastes good is fine. Sometimes not having the perfect rationalized motivation for everything I put in my body is necessary. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I sleep in, sometimes I can't sleep. Sometimes like being able to have that flexibility and like openness to my body choosing some things and my brain choosing some things and like skipping a couple days of working out, like all of that was super painful to let go of this like constricted concept of like perfection. Yeah. And having to be like sometimes at some point in your life Someone will say that you're lazy or you're being lazy or that you didn't do something perfectly or that they did something and worked harder than you. And like, that's going to be true because that's a human thing. Right. <laughs> now, yeah. well, and I'm curious because, um, because now you also coach and engage and teach other people. Mm -hmm. um, I'm leaning towards a, a kind of introduction of sorts. Right. Well, I'm still <laughs> eating handgun. 
and I'm still here with Gretchen Lee. Hi. Okay. And so you, you're teaching people to engage with different parts of their bodies. Mm -hmm. um, would you mind telling us a little? Yeah, I mean, I think it's in like all of, as I was just babbling about myself, you know, I'm thinking about that the two main realms I work in, I am a personal trainer, I specifically work with a general population who wants to have more strength and conditioning. I do a lot of like basic powerlifting movements. I wouldn't say that I generally coach powerlifters, but my basis is in powerlifting and basic strength. Um, and, and then I teach sex ed to people of all ages, but specifically mostly adults. Um, and working in those two realms, I see so much vulnerability and so much, it's just like, it's all dealing with people's experientialism. It's all dealing with how people are relating to their bodies and living in their bodies every day. Mm -hmm. And like, both of those things, I think, you know, you can say, you can come to a personal trainer and say like, I want to look hotter in these jeans. I want to feel good about myself. I want to have a bigger butt. Like all of those things you think are physical and like I can write you a program and we can do them. Right. But there's a lot more to, I want to feel good about myself. You like kind of write that off on a list of like, if I work out, I will feel good about myself. But like that, your feelings aren't something you can fix with the barbell. <laughs> sure. Well, and if, if you're working out in a way where you're like still sabotaging and, and stabbing yourself yeah. with the thoughts that you have. Yeah. And I mean, and I get the same sort of questions in sex ed, someone coming up and being, you know, saying something like, well, I've never really had an orgasm. So give me this. So obviously what I need from you is the sex toy that will give me an orgasm. And it's the same sort of like, I, I work in these fields where people desperately want to come up to me and say like, hey, so I know that you do this job for money. Let me give you money and you give me the thing that will fix this problem. Yes. And like, in general, the thing that they think is the problem is not really the problem. Oh, I love this. Thank you. Keep going. <laughs> or, or it is, but there is like a lot more to it than like, sure, Hitachi Magic Wand gets a lot of people off by that the end or being like sure I can write you a four day a week strength programming with a lot of glute focus and it might grow your butt you know like those sorts of things are uh, their answers to those questions but they're not at all tapping into like the human who is asking me to help them yeah with this thing yeah and like and that's sort of the level where I came to both of these interests and careers from the same point of like we all are these like complicated mix up of, of humans and feelings and like learning and interests and shame and all of that. And like, we are stuck in these bodies that work sometimes not in the ways that we want them to, or look not in the way that we're told they're supposed to, mm -hmm. or that we would change with a magic wand if we were given the chance. And like, there is a lot, a lot of discomfort of just like sitting in this body that you have right where it is mm -hmm. and being like, here we are. There's a lot of discomfort in that. And yeah. I think a lot of, of my job is sitting in that discomfort with people. Fuck yeah. And like, it's a lot, it can be really heavy. <laughs> yeah, so here's the thing I've been chewing on because we were talking earlier, not on camera necessarily, about how we're trying to like describe how we do tons of things. Mm -hmm. You were touching on a thing I really want to describe in my website is like, I help people, so I'm gonna point at spaces. So people come in asking me, like they think they have this problem and they want this result. But what they actually have is this problem. Mm -hmm. And it turns out what they really want is this result. And so like mm -hmm. you have to you have to start the conversation where people actually are. Yeah. It's like I know that people walk into the room asking me, Oh, I wanna I wanna make more money, right? Mm -hmm. I wanna deal with my money issues. And I'm like, in my head I translate money to probably sexuality or some sort of relationship is the real problem. Yeah for the goal that they want because they want to achieve this sort of house and this sort of like income level and like actually they think that they want that because they like their baggage has them attached to this idea of what they think that they want but what they actually want was going to be the surprise unknown that we're going to discover together so i have to say yes i can help you with your money so you can achieve this goal full well knowing that it's likely some other root cause and some other thing they actually want yeah yeah and i mean like 
I think, you know, there's something you should always listen to the thing that people are telling you that they yeah. want. Like, yeah. absolutely. And I can help people. Sometimes it is really simple. Someone's like, hey, my vibrator died and I love it. I want the same vibrator, a new one. And you're like, great, here it is. <laughs> and like, sometimes there are simple answers to things. Yes. The same thing with personal training. If someone's like, oh, I have this shoulder injury that keeps bugging me. I want to get back to lifting weights. I can help them rehab their shoulder. Boom. You know, but it's like, but I think what separates someone who is like, you know, giving and exchanging answers like that from someone who wants to like dig in and, and help people and do work with people is saying like, yes, totally, I will help you rehab your shoulder. Also, like, what else has been keeping you back from doing this before? Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, how long has your shoulder been injured? Oh, like a couple years. Like, how come this is the first time that you've come into the gym? No judgment, but what's been going on in that interim? Yeah. You know, or of saying like, yeah, when I like, I have so much anxiety when I sleep that I keep re-injuring it because I clench my arms up so tight. I'm like, what's going on there? You know, yeah. like there's so much to that. And I hear that a lot. Like one of the, one of the times that I hear the most um, kind of pain and looking for a fast solution, this is like a total switch from personal training, but is in my other line of work in sex education and sex toy sales, when people who have penises can't get erections, that is like in our society such like a thing that is not supposed to happen. Yeah. Like we have to have hard cocks all the time at yep. the ready, but yep. only when we want them. And like if people being like, I need the perfect cock ring and I need it to solve all my problems, end of story. Yeah. And like, there's so much more to it. Like, and I mean, that's, you know, one example, but, and again, like I could sell someone a cock ring for 12 bucks and like hope it works and send them on their merry way. And that sometimes is all people are ready for and that's fine. Sure. I don't need to push anyone to anywhere that they're not ready to go. But if someone's willing to like, you know, come up to me after a class that I've taught and say like, hey, my body's really going through a lot of changes and like I don't feel like I have control over this part of me that I feel like there's so much expectation and worth and masculinity and all of this tied up in yeah. and I don't know what to do about that. Right. Like we're probably going to have a much better conversation. Oh, heck yeah. 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 Well, and in my head I'm like, well, I think it's, it, uh, I've always thought it was a bit challenging that just because you have a penis you think you have to use it in all of the <laughs> moments. I'm like, well, just get it. There are so many shapes. Of other things you can just use and strap on and every it's the fun true. keeps happening. It's true. Maybe, but it's just, I mean, like, we want our bodies to be able to accomplish and do the things that we dream of. Like, the sky is not the limit. Yeah. That kind of, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. We're sort of frontier culture, frontierism culture. Like, yeah. Ah, the next best thing. Yeah. And I think, yeah, there is a lot, like, I mean, kind of like what I was just saying, I think there is, there's a lot of my jobs that is sitting with people and saying, like, that sounds really hard. Like, that sucks. I think mean, you probably heard me do that in our sex skills boot camp. You know, I remember one person bringing up, um, you know, talking about when we do a, a basic, uh, like, elevator speech about our sexual health and our safer sex status and mm -hmm. whatever, and being like, okay, what about those of us that got, like, big, glaring things that deviate us from the norm? Right. Like, how do we talk about that in a five-minute elevator speech? Sure. You know, and, and saying, like, you know, instead of having a quick quip answer where it's like, your body's great. Anyone who doesn't accept it, that's their problem. You right. know, as much as that might be true, like that is not that person's experience going through the world. Like there's so much pain sitting there saying like, I don't have the kind of body I can talk about in five minutes. Yeah. And then sitting there with that person and being like, how fucking terrifying. And like, that is a lot of what I spend my time doing. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah, like, that's it's terrifying. just been like, wow, that sounds so hard. Like, yeah. how can I support you in that? You know? It's a big job. Yeah. <laughs> when did you, did you, did you know that you had signed up for that? When you signed up for that? I did. I did. Um, I've always been a sort of mediator type. That was always my role in, the, in my family. I'm, a, I'm the baby of the family and uh, have always been sort of the, like, I'll hear your side and I'll hear your side and then we'll like I'll talk about it and like I'll make everybody happy and I mean that that's something I'm working through in therapy like sure, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. um but I think <laughs> you know the my interest in 
that and holding space for people and of being someone that can be the person that someone runs up to and being like, I don't know why I wanted to tell you this, but I'm gonna tell you that I had sex yesterday or that my butt looked great this morning. Like cultivating some sort of energy about myself where I can be a person that people wanna share with in that way has always been super important to me. Mm -hmm. And I think like there have been a lot of times where I felt shame about my body or fear about something or didn't have something modeled for me and all I really wanted was to like turn to someone and have them like hold my hand and say wow what a big experience you're having and there's not much space for that they also don't entirely teach it no not really (laughs) they teach versions of it I remember in middle school there was some sort of like peer I have a friend who will actually literally remember the title of the thing, so I can call her later and say, mm-hmm. were we? we're like sort of peer advocate types, and we were trained, and I remembered the active, was it active listening? Mm-hmm. Or somebody would say, I like peanut butter sandwiches, and you'd be like, I, I heard. heard. Do you like peanut butter sandwiches? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, uh, but that was, that was not really, they didn't mm-hmm. teach us about like how to hold, like how to hold ourselves and, yeah. and like, reflecting someone's body right. and other things. There's there are actual strategies to actually do mediation in a very successful way for people. Yeah, and I would certainly like I'm no expert at the things that require training. You know, I was a I was an RA in college. I went through those basic trainings. I have a basic advocacy training through I called a safety here in town to do sexual assault response. Yeah. And like those things absolutely I'm I'm grateful for those trainings, but it's the like it's the experience of doing it that that makes you good at it, mm-hmm. you know? And I don't think I'm the right person for everybody, but hopefully I'm the right person for some people to talk to about stuff. Totally. And and it's like, yeah, there are, there are solutions I can, you know, to some problems or issues or concerns, and I can definitely, I think in a personal training program, I can definitely help people achieve the goals that they wrote down. Um, I think, like you said, sometimes those goals end up being a little different than what they originally thought. Totally. Um, but the process looks a lot less like we are started in one place and we're working towards a solution. The process looks a lot more like sort of wandering all over and like trying some things than being like, oh, well that brought up something completely different. And like, right. you know, and that's how it goes. Perfect, <laughs> just make sure that that's on our intake forms. Yeah, <laughs> right, you're like, do you consent to this being a wandering map of <laughs> insecurities and confusion and whatever else? Yeah. Brilliant, I would love to talk to you about, so here you are in a position where you're helping a lot of people. Are there okay. some like mm-hmm. fun edges of, of things Ooh. you're trying to accomplish in your own life right now? <sighs> yeah. Um, I mean, I was mentioning to you before that a real kind of interesting thing that's come out of my job recently, and as I'm doing more education out in the community and teaching classes all over, is that like, I'm really, over the last year probably, my personal style of teaching in front of a group has started to blossom. Um, and it's it's been interesting to see uh, definitely to feel my own instinctive humor come out um, has been interesting because at first I was too nervous to be funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I used to get so nervous before I taught. I, get, I have a total vocal tell and I sound like I'm going to cry. Um, that's no good. But, uh, you know, to be able to like find that I'm funny when I'm comfortable mm-hmm. and um, the ways of relating to an audience, like picking up on watching people's faces change and listening to the banter that I have. I now have a thing in a, you know, when it's appropriate to, when it's a group of adults, um, I often will like put into my intro, after I give the basic spiel, I'll ask for questions, uh, comments, concerns, or compliments, Mm -hmm. and then tell people that like, I really thrive on compliments and feedback. And so if people want to just shout out compliments at me, like they're welcome to. Nice. And it's actually worked out really well for me. Nice. Um, it, I mean, of course it depends on the required professionalism of the situation, but like if I can be in a room where I'm bantering with people and people are throwing out their questions to me or saying like, I love the way you explained that. And I will, my agreement is like, if I can see who said it, I will turn to you and pause and say thank you directly. Right. And like, and it's great. It's worked out really well, and I didn't see that modeled by anyone before I started doing it. I just had to think about like, what am I? What do I get out of this? Like, yeah. what feeds me? 
I love that. <laughs> How many trainers in a thing have come up and said, okay, so I'm gonna train you this thing. It's my responsibility to make sure that you have the learning that mm -hmm. you want and, and I can accomplish this. So you like, give me feedback on what you wanna learn. But also, if you do this thing, I'm gonna be a better trainer for you. Yeah. If you tell me how great I am, yeah. this is gonna be a better experience mm -hmm. for everybody. Yep. And I was like, I it's that. simple. You know, compliments are easy to give and they make, they like brighten my day, so. <laughs> and I don't, I've like, you know, that sort of, so, so figuring out how to not just be a good teacher, but to be like my most authentic teach yourself mm -hmm. um, has been really cool and that also affects my ability to train people and to know like I'm you know I've learned a lot from the awesome coaches that I've had but then how to be like okay but who am I when I'm saying this information like totally. what do I personally have to give to you and you know it's been really great the last few sex ed classes I've taught I've brought my business cards that say like I'm a personal trainer and you know I can throw out there like I'm sure sex positive, you know, like you can definitely don't worry about, you know, talking about your sex stuff or whatever, even if that's not the, the realm that we're in, you know, being able to bring that openness and inclusiveness to what I do is helpful. Yeah, I have a friend that, oh, let's see if I can remember how he phrased this. He said that every that everybody has like a secret motivation. There's the there's the reason you tell people that you want to achieve a goal mm. with physicality, but what's your secret reason? And one of his was that he'd seen um, Magic Mike, mm. that show, and he's just like, I just want to look good and naked and to be able to dance well. And I don't maybe people do people write that openly to you sometimes. Oftentimes. Yeah. Sometimes, like the secret the secret goal, the secret yeah. desires behind yeah. things. We usually talk about that. I have a tendency like I can. I get a little bit uncomfortable if I'm doing ongoing work with people and I can tell that they're not being open with me about their secret motivations. Yeah. Um, and it's, of course, like it's their right to not tell me whatever they don't want to tell me, but I will have, uh, sometimes I'll have a hard time doing ongoing stuff with people if I feel like there's not openness and vulnerability. Because I feel like as someone who's, you know, in charge in that situation, I try and show up with a lot of vulnerability right. and a lot of like, this is what my limits are. This is what I can do. This is who I am. And like sharing that about myself in the hopes that we'll have a reciprocal learning and growing. And if someone's holding back, like that can be challenging and that's on, that's up to them. They can share whatever they want, but I sometimes worry that we're not going to get to the deeper, whatever it is, Yeah, you know? I think there's a philosophy in our culture that people are, even when you're hiring a person that you're doing something, even hilariously, even when you're getting help mm. from an actual human person, you think that you're doing it on your own. Mm. And that, like, so a lot of people feel responsible because we have this trope of the rugged individualist, right? Achieving everything on it. But the best work that happens is when people are doing it together. Yeah. Like, that's why you hire a coach. That's why you go for other opinions. Yeah. I think I know for me, <laughs> I've definitely struggled with like wanting my therapist to like me and like that sort of phenomenon where yeah. I'm like, it takes me a little while to be open and trusting enough to share the parts about myself that I don't like. Right. Because I'm so much like, obviously I'm in therapy for a reason, but here's all the reasons, like, please be my friend, please like me, like I'm actually perfect. And <laughs> it like <laughs> takes me a little while before I'm like, okay, I trust you enough that like, Ooh, here's some things that aren't so great. And then I'm always reminded like, that's my whole job is to hear the things that are great. And so I, I try and really make that space. You know, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a licensed professional in that realm. Right. But like making that same space to to say like, it's I'm, I'm here for the parts that aren't pretty and I'm going to model, hopefully, how to be a person who supports people with parts of themselves they don't like. Right. And. It's been something that I've been really grateful for in my community that I feel like I've recently really noticed is the amount of people I have in my life who are willing to show up for the parts of me that aren't perfect and aren't pretty. And totally. it means a lot. And what's ridiculous is when you actually get somebody that you can have an, uh, a connection with where because they're reflecting and showing up and, and supporting those areas of it, the, like the things that we think are ugly become more beautiful and we mm. become more beautiful for having 
those areas be seen. Yeah. Like I, I too had that thing about having therapists like coming for help and this hard parts, but I'm gonna do this soft shoe. Right. I'm gonna put on a whole show for yeah, you. And I've totally already got it figured out. I'm like, don't even worry about it. Look how <laughs> like, amazing I am at figuring out my own problem. Yeah. Why yeah. am we here? But uh, one of my edges in the last year is allowing myself the kind of honesty and vulnerability in these kinds of, when I'm asking for help, allowing someone to help me, mm -hmm. showing up. Uh, I actually recently read Masks of Masculinity hmm. and some aspects of like healing the, our culture of masculinity, of like having shit figured out, yeah. this level of like presenting a mask of confidence at all, sure. all moments, even in these times where I'm literally in the room where someone's supposed to allow me to like get help and cry. I remember talking to a therapist. I, I had emotion come up and I was about to cry. She's like, and I was just not letting it happen. She's like, you know, you can cry in here. And what I literally said in the room was like, I'm paying money for this. I can yeah. cry at home or later in the car. I'm here to get therapy. And that was like 10 years ago and I'm giggling about it, but that was, an, Still like, was my honest there. response yeah. to mm. what it meant to like really release this idea of like controlling every moment and showing up in a particular way I thought I was supposed to. Yeah. Even to fucking therapy. Like yeah. I'm, I'm, I need therapy. I love allow myself a level of vulnerability to like walk out and pay for this person to help me, but not the vulnerability to actually allow it to work. Yeah, it's interesting. I think like you know you are not alone in that. I certainly do it too, and I, I, I think about like the amount of times in my life that I've shared something vulnerable and relevant. You know, not just like oversharing constantly, hopefully, but sure. um, <laughs> vulnerable and relevant in a in a personal interaction, and had someone say like, "I'm so glad you said that because I'm going through something similar." Totally. Or like that opened the door for me to be able to share something about myself too, and like. That is super powerful. That ability to, to give and share and sit with people is like, it's the whole thing. Absolutely. It's the whole thing's about. <laughs> it's true. I have a curiosity. Yes. Um, we have uh, some moments. Mm -hmm. I'm respecting your time. It's fine. Is there something amazing going on in your life that you would like me to help you celebrate? Oh my God. Ooh. Since you decided to like compliments, I'd like to like, like, Help the moment of like being proud of you or something like hmm. you know, your athlete persona. Or... Yeah, I mean, in my athlete persona, I am in this like big moment of uh, figuring out who I am as an athlete. Also, um, I have the state championships in Olympic style weightlifting in less than two weeks. Cool. Um, so it's not. I mean, it's certainly not a, a big deal in a world perspective, but it's the biggest competition that I've been to in this sport. So that's cool. Right. Um, I. I don't know. I feel like most of the stuff in my life, like I'm taking some big leaps and some big learning, but I don't have anything that's like, oh, shout it from the rooftops right now. That's fair. Yeah. It's not a requirement. I just, I'm like, I'm, I'd be willing to be like, hey, I feel like I owe you. I appreciate Actually, that. Yes. You're in, you're in a learning space. I'm in a learning space and that is, that's, that's pretty worth celebrating. Deal. I feel like I'm taking, I'm making some really big steps in my own life right now about like, that balance of perfectionism and drive and motivation and wanting to like respect the parts of myself that push me to move forward and to be determined and goal oriented and like make shit happen mm -hmm. because like in the realm of sex ed like we talked about um with aj like in the realm of sex ed a lot of it is like fake it till you make it and do it for yourself until people believe you right and so I'm finally, after a long time, in a tiny moment of abundance where people are like reaching out to me to hire me for things. Nice. Instead of me having to be like, also I'm a professional, you know, yeah. like, and I'm still doing that work, but I am like letting the tide kind of come back to me a little bit and see like, oh, people are responding, people are listening, people are like seeking me out. Mm -hmm. And, but like balancing, the respect for the part of myself that that does that and gives me drive gives me motivation because I love that part of myself mm -hmm. and also trying to sit in this part of myself that is like if I had continued to live in that part of my brain that was like all perfection all drive like drive into the ground and then keep yeah. drilling to the center of the earth right. if I had continued to live in that part of me I wouldn't be alive anymore 
like it is my softness and my empathy and my ability to slow down that has kept me alive that has brought me amazing partners that has yeah. brought me an amazing community and allowed me the time and energy to hold space for people right and so like there's i'm i'm trying to find the ways to zip those two parts of myself together instead of feeling like they live in two different competing camps or that they have two completely different highest goals because mm -hmm. it turns out that they <laughs> likely shared the same highest yeah. goal for you to have yeah. a great life and I'm relating I'm pointing to me even though I said you to have a great life because I have those <laughs> aspects too yeah of like part of the part of where we started where I'm like yeah those 15 pounds were me figuring out what slow supple deep meant mm -hmm. and recognizing that slowness uh, allowed me to have the goals and get them easier yeah without a lot of work because hard work isn't necessary yeah. for all of the things and to actually fully be able to actually appreciate the training of deeply and fully and completely experiencing the things that I was eating mm. allowed me to not like what happens if you keep being a fucking driven goal oriented person but you never fucking feel your life yeah. I'm saying fucking a lot because it's that it's important. intense yeah it's an intense feeling I got the goal that I can't feel because right. I don't know how to do yeah. that because now there's another one yeah, yeah. I'm always focused and yeah. I think slow is the new fast mm. because sometimes the slowness gets you there faster yeah they it's I mean depending on like your your schooling and your philosophy it's a very yin yang or like masculine yeah. energy feminine energy like right. whatever I think there's been like a lot of camps that have tried to teach us <laughs> this for a long time <laughs> and shockingly you know, we don't listen right. until we're actually sitting in it right um or injured yeah <laughs> or sick yeah yeah, which are, those are some of the hardest times to have to learn, but hopefully we do yeah. learn from those things. Perfect. Yeah. I might button there because we've come to a couple minutes before 2.30. Right. That was your ask of me. Sounds good. Gretchen, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. Bye, you. <laughs> it's right here. Well, that's how that went. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on this episode. Thanks for watching, listening, I don't know, reading, imbibing, however you took this in. Thanks for being here. And if you really enjoyed it, I'd, I'd love it if you would do all of the things. Uh, like, share, I don't know, ring a bell, bang a gong, tell a friend, and come back next time. I hope you had as much fun as I have.